Okay, I'm going to tell you about the Harwell aging screen. Um, this isn't my project. This is led by uh, Paul Potter at Harwell, but I'm a user of this, of this program. Um, so I have to thank Paul for a number of the slides here, but I've given a couple of examples from my own group where we've accessed the aging screen just to give you a flavor of the sorts of models that you can obtain. So aging, aging mice, and there was a question this morning about aging and how important it was. It is, it is important. It is, it is a, a, a factor. Um, and uh, the aging process um, is, is a complex one. Um, there's uh, disease incidences uh, vary with age, uh, and there are specific age-related diseases and uh, phenotypes. So having an aging screen that tries to capture those later onset um, diseases is, is important. So we're using aging as, as a challenge uh, in order to identify uh, mutants that reveal gene function in the aging environment. So we're interested in genes that, uh, that um, predispose you to disease as you age. Our current aging pipeline goes out to 18 months. Um, this is not a screen for longevity. So mice will live longer than 18 months, but it's a good compromise in terms of the health of the animal. So this is not a longevity screen. The aim is to identify later onset phenotypes that may reveal new sets of genes that uh, may be of interest in aging in the human population. Um, this is a mutagenesis um, approach. So we're using uh, N-ethyl nitrosurea um, to generate these models. Um, and any ethyl nitrosurea, or ENU, is a point mutagen. It introduces um, mostly single base pair changes, um, missense mutations, splice mutations, nonsense mutations. Um, and uh, these, these mutations result in different sorts of uh, phenotypes. So um, this is a phenotype-driven screen. So we mutagenize mice, and uh, we breed them, and then we have a population of mice that we phenotype. So we make no assumption, because the mutagenesis is random throughout the genome, we make no assumption about which genes are involved. We, um, we're looking for interesting phenotypes, um, and from there we go back and identify what the underlying gene is. So we've got the potential to identify novel genes or pathways involved in disease, so without any prior knowledge of those pathways. Our screens are uh, designed around the interests of the different programs in the unit, so in my case, diabetes and obesity, but other um, external users are also applying screens. There is the potential to apply this to uh, mice that have other genetic modifications as a sensitized screen. And in the past, we have done sensitized screens without an aging component. So these uh, point mutations are relatively easy to, um, to map and to then identify by next generation sequencing. They generate different types of alleles, so hypermorphs, hypermorphs, neomorphs. Um, and they have advantages or perhaps it's better to say they're complementary with knockout strategies. So you make a knockout mutation, um, you lose the function of a gene. That doesn't happen that often in human populations. It's more, more frequent to find point mutations. So we have the, the opportunity to generate novel models of human disease and to assign new functions to genes and identify new genes and pathways. That's the aim of the screen. So the next slide just shows some of the breeding involved. So we, we mutagenize C57 black 6J mice with ENU. Um, this introduces point mutations. The mice become sterile for a while, and when they recover fertility, their sperm are carrying mutations. And there's about 50 per uh, spermatozoan. These male mice are crossed with uh, C3H, untreated mice, to generate um, a, a G1 population, which is crossed to C3H. And then these mice are back crossed to their um, fathers. So 
then this generates a G3 population. This back cross step means that we've homozygosed some of the DNA. So some of the mutations are homozygous. So this is a recessive screen, essentially, although we would pick up dominance as well, because we've, because we've homozygosed some of the DNA by back crossing to their fathers, females to their fathers. So we have a, a G3 population, which we can phenotype, and uh, which carries heterozygous and homozygous mutations from this e and &E mutagenesis step at the beginning. So this population is subject to um, phenotyping. So this rather colorful slide just illustrates some of the, the different types of screens. So there's a hearing screen, a vision screen, clinical chemistry, neurobehavior, musculoskeletal, body composition, diabetes, cardiac, and over the, uh, over the 80 weeks of the, of the screen, tests are applied at different times. And they're sort of, they're, the tests are selected and timed so that they hopefully don't interfere with each other. So in a bit more detail, um, the sorts of tests that are being applied are illustrated on, on this slide. Um, so we have, and these tests are repeated over time as well. So it's not just, it's not just a single time point. These things are repeated over the 18, 18 months of the screen. So we have the opportunity to, build, to pick out early onset phenotypes, say at 12 weeks, and, the, uh, and distinguish those from later onset, and also to follow the progression of traits over time. So if, if something appears, um, does it get worse with time? So um, there's various uh, screens based on clinical chemistry, fasted bleeds, um, tests to reveal renal function. In my own area, there's a glucose torrance test, which you've already seen um, a couple of times. Um, echo MRI, which gives you body composition, so fat and lean mass, uh, obviously body weight. Um, DEXA, uh, which gives you fat and lean mass, but also bone parameters. Um, in the neurobehavioral area, there's a circadian challenge, sleep, anal sleep analysis, pupillometry. Um, uh, in the deafness screen, there's a click box, which is fairly straightforward, but uh, uh, brainstem response uh, as a more uh, detailed test. So there are lots of phenotype tests being applied to these G3 mice at repeated time points, as you saw on the previous slide. Pedigrees are uh, bred to generate about 100 mice in two cohorts. Um, the G1 founders are, are all archived in case we want to go back and breed some more. Um, and we've been screening about two to three pedigrees a month. So 100 mice gives you uh, plenty of mice for, for mapping and plenty of power for mapping. So within my own screens, we've been looking at 50 mice, 50 male mice. Um, so obviously there's 50 male and 50 female mice in here. 50 male mice uh, gives you enough, uh, enough affected individuals to be able to get a map location and then identify the gene by next generation sequencing. So mapping are done. You, mapping is done on DNA that's sent off for uh, uh, SMP typing on, on an Illumina panel. Um, depends on, on, the, on the trait, but four to six affected mice. Um, and uh, once we've got a map position, we may send mice then for uh, whole genome sequencing. And if necessary, fill in some of the gaps with conventional sequencing. So it's quite rapid once you've got a phenotype to find the, uh, find the mutation. Um, so this gives some idea of the total number of mutations found in each of the screens. So hearing's been extremely successful. And you may be hearing a bit about this when Steve talks tomorrow. Um, they've not only have they identified the most mutants, they've identified the underlying genes of the most mutants. So there are a few still at you know, uh, the phenotype stage where there's just a phenotype and they don't know what the gene is yet. A, f a relatively few that are, that are mapped but not cloned and the rest they know all the genes for. So it's been extremely successful. Uh, in my own area in diabetes, we haven't had so many cloned genes. We've got quite a few phenotypes and we're in the process of trying to narrow down the genes. And in our case, we're, we're dealing with glucose torrance test data, which is quantitative and, and can be more problematical for the, for the mapping and cloning step. Um, quite a few of these uh, phenotypes are early onset, but a significant proportion are, are late onset. 
So it's working as an aging screen. We are picking up things that we would not have seen um, if we'd only stuck to an early, an early time point and then finished the experiment. So it's, re it's yielding value in terms of later onset uh, phenotypes. And this is just some running statistics. Um, 157 pedigrees have gone into the aging screen so far. Uh, 134 have reached completion. It takes 18 months to complete, so it takes a long time. Um, 100 phenotypes in total. Uh, 25 between the first, between the seven, between seven and 18 months of age. So a significant number. 10 mutants provide novel information about a known gene. 12 provide completely novel information about a gene, which is something we really want. Um, and two phenotypes are associated with a gene that didn't have a function previously. Uh, and the screen's still ongoing. So more summary uh, statistics here. 100 phenotypes, 71 map, 43 clones. This Agricam mutant, um, which uh, an investigative scientist in the group, Michelle Goldsworthy, has been working on, has come out recently as well. This is a, a mouse that um, starts out um, with, these are the homozygotes in red again, with uh, low weight. Um, but interestingly, um, they have reduced lean mass compared to heterozygotes and wild types. But they also show this increase in fat mass at 18 months. So this is a late onset phenotype. And that they, these 18 month old animals are, are, have significant, significantly increased um, fat mass. So that could point to a novel role of um, agrican in, in adipose tissue. Um, so these, might, these are, um, Dexter images, and you can see that these mice are very fat. Um, and they look very odd. Their dist fat distribution is very strange. So um, as I said, this, 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 was, this was identified through the phenotype tests. It was mapped with high confidence to chromosome 7. Um, sequencing was carried out, and we found a mutation in agrican, this extracellular matrix component. Um, so we know, it's known that uh, agrican is critical for cartilage structure and function of joints. That's a known, uh, a known phenotype disease association in mouse and human. Um, but the adipose tissue uh, phenotypes are novel. Um, this is gonadal um, visceral fat um, in wild types and uh, homozygotes. Um, so this is gonadal and this is brown adipose tissue, I think. Yes, it is, yeah. So you can see larger fat, larger fat cells in the, in the mutant mice compared to wild type lysomates. And in the brown adipose tissue, you can see these much smaller lipid droplets, which might suggest more active um, brown adipose tissue thermogenesis. As I said, it's well known for a role in um, bone and joint uh, diseases. And at the top here, we have a wild type animal. And you can see this nice, this is a knee. You can see this nice sort of um, smooth articulating joint here. Um, but in the uh, mutants, you can see that this is broken down. There's ectopic bone, extracellular matrix cartilage. And the, and the joint is fused, so they are unable to bend this joint. Um, as I said, the, there are different mutations in, in mouse. So there is uh, a deletion, but that's associated with growth defects. Um, our mutation has this novel association with late onset obesity and suggests a role in perhaps in, in adiposity. Um, and then there are a number of human diseases associated with mutations in, in this gene involving uh, growth plate um, function. So the, um, there is some report of expression of agrican in uh, subcutaneous and gonadal adipose tissue uh, fats and in cellular fractions from adipose tissue, so um, pre um, So 
there could be a role for, for agrican in adipogenesis, which has been revealed by this by, by the aging screen. So that was my second example. Um, the aging screen's ongoing. Further pedigrees are going through. Um, they're going to run through about 100 IMPC knockouts um, to see how they how their phenotypes develop over time. And I think there'll be some selection and cherry picking of the, the right lines, and there might be a call for that as well. Um, and uh, ongoing following up of individual mutants and getting more people interested in, in the screen. So um, as I said, this is uh, uh, this, the aging screen is led by Paul Potter, and these are the people in his group. Um, but the, there are lots of other groups accessing the uh, the phenotype, the screen, and, and applying phenotypes tests in new behavior, neurodegeneration, deafness, diabetes, renal disease, um, the people in, in Oxford, arthritis, biocomputing. So biocomputing is important for the analysis of, um, of the genotyping and sequencing data, but also tracking all the phenotyping data and putting them into ontologies and making the data accessible. And the Wars 2 work was done by, as I said, Tom in my group. Um, and we have a number of collaborators uh, across the unit in the deafness group and uh, uh, with mitochondrial um, groups in, in Oxford and Newcastle. Um, and this is largely funded by the Medical Research Council, but some additional screens have been added by funding from other organizations. Thank you very much. Sure.